Good afternoon, everybody. This is Peter. This is our September 23rd biweekly radio address. I hope everyone's doing okay. Uh, for the next two hours, I'm going to be talking at you, doing questions. There's about 70 of these, and also going over some some uh, new points or interesting points I think worth bringing up. As most of you probably know, uh, Mr. Moore has released a film called Capitalism, The Love Story. It's officially being released in Los Angeles and New York tonight, if I remember correctly. Uh, a friend of mine went to the semi-private premiere on Monday, and I got some interesting feedback on it. It seems to be very interesting. Uh, as everyone knows, this man has a tremendous stretch when it comes to uh, his effect on people. I don't know of any, any other documentary filmmaker that can affect so many people in such a mainstream way. So his film, again, I haven't seen it, but from the feedback I've gotten, I have a feeling it's going to give us a lot of uh, enforcement, a lot of reinforcement as far as the movement. And I think we should piggyback on this as much as possible. Again, wait and see it for yourself. Make your own decisions. But uh, from what I heard, uh, it's, of course, anti-capitalistic. And as we all know, and hopefully most listening know, that it really isn't about capitalism per se. It's about the very structure of the labor monetary reward system and what it rewards and the corruption that, that it essentially gives birth to on a daily basis. That's actually the problem. Of course, more I don't think offers any broad solutions. He tells you to fight the system and things like that in various ways, protest and you know, your typical traditional, traditional activism stuff, which is good. But um, I think if people go out to, say, theaters or if they need anybody who has seen this film, it's an absolute beautiful opening to engage the Venus Project and the Zeitgeist Movement in topic. And uh, I had some emails from people saying they were going to create DVDs and go to the releases and you know, hand them out to people or even cards or pamphlets, or anything that you think would be uh, good. It's a great grassroots type of thing, because I have a feeling that when this film hits the street, it's going to create a big buzz, and the Moors are definitely going to be attacked as a socialist and a communist, if he wasn't already. Uh, but he, of course, he has a great deal of clout, and that's, you know, that's one of the great things about, about his position, being the sort of documentary superstar that he is, is people will listen to the film, and I think this is a, a great thing. And again, I haven't seen it, but uh, from what I heard, I'll be very surprised. Be, from what I heard, in fact, I, I would have to say he has to have heard of Mr. Fresco at this point, even though he doesn't advocate the same ideas. Some of the com comments that were suggested to me really made it sound like he had become aware of a lot of the issues that we talked about, at least as far as the faulty issues of the system. And he apparently deliberately states in the film that that the banking system essentially runs, thing, which runs things, which is what we've been talking about for a long time. And I think uh, once the public kind of gets it under their belt, it'll make things a lot easier in this transition that we're all basically in. And as far as I'm concerned, we're in the transition right now. So anyway, if uh, you want to get out there and do some activism stuff, by all means, I recommend it as a grassroots, hands-on type of thing. Uh, the premiere, I think, uh, I think it's just Los Angeles and New York. But, uh, you know, when you hit the blogs, if you hit a, see Michael Moore blogs, you know, anything, anything you want to get out there, because this, this is going to create some momentum, and we should ride that as long as we can. A uh, second issue, the Venus Project has embarked on their European journey. They think they left today, and they're going to Copenhagen and then London, and I, I really wish them the best, and I hope everybody out there that's in the areas goes and, and sees them and talks to them and listens to them. Uh, Jacques, of course, is 93. Uh, there's only so many opportunities that anyone's going to have to uh, to experience him in person. Uh, but uh, that should be very uh, helpful. And when I get information about streams and video, I'll, of course, make all of that live on the website. Um, other small issue, volunteers for the Knowledge Database. Going through the questions today, there's, of course, lots of repeated questions and questions that easily could have been answered if people had access to the prior radio shows or better yet, access to a searchable database where these points could be found. So I would like to try and find some volunteers, ideally those that have been helping with the transcriptions of the radio show. If you want to help volunteer and get, in, get these questions into the system, and then I'm going to go in and uh, basically insert my prior answers and clean them up because my written, my written answers are always better than my verbal. I Naturally, like most people, I think better in writing. But... Um, if you want to volunteer, email media at thezeitgeistmovement.com with the subject volunteer, and uh, we'll get a handful of people to try and do something with the knowledge database. And there's other things, too, that I, I really need volunteers to help with. And I know everybody out there wants to help in certain ways, but there are specific focus points with the website that aren't necessarily the most glamorous, but I could, we could definitely use help. 
Uh, on that note, the zeitgeistmediaproject.com is uh, the site is not up yet, but it is in the process, and we have the designer for for the Venus Project site working on that. And from what I've gotten feedback-wise, it looks like it's going to be fantastic with lots of lots of parameters um, to engage every form of media, and this would be very important for the communications team. So that uh, that's going to be up fairly soon, and I'm looking forward to that. That should be the central hub essentially for the communications team, and uh, there will be a hub for the activism team. Um, and a hub for the other team as well. We're the, from Venus to Earth, or from Earth to Venus, that's another one, but that's more complex because we have to learn the API algorithm uh, programming language of Google Earth to figure out if we can actually do it. What that site's going to be is essentially a, a running initial database of the planetary resources and then strategic angles of how to create a systems approach to the world as we, as we know it in the most beneficial, optimized, conservative way possible. And uh, granted, that's a massive concept, but we have to start somewhere. I'm looking forward to hearing the ideas of those that are uh, in science, uh, those that are in engineering, that are technologically oriented, or even just design-oriented, because it's not really a matter of understanding technology as it is thinking creatively about how to organize the resources of the planet in a way that's most efficient for the betterment of the entire planet, all borders removed. Uh, and, uh, let's see what else I have here. Oh yeah, next Wednesday. If you're if you're in New York, there's uh, I was just contacted by an organization called Lucid NYC, and I'm going to be giving a 15 minute presentation. Probably just going to call it the Zeitgeist Movement 15 minutes because in 15 minutes there's only very little, so very little you can do. But I will be at an event. Uh, I'll post it actually as well. But it's, I think it's LucidNYC.com, and I will be given a very quick primer, and I'll be there. So if anyone in the New York chapter movement, New York City chapter, wants to come by there, I have no idea if they charge anything. Again, I'm just doing it because it's, it's, not, it's not far from me. It's certainly not a, a pressing event or something I would consider to be very much a part of the movement itself because it's so small and it has ulterior, ulterior motives in and of itself. It's more of an expo of different ideas by different people. But if you felt like coming out, uh, I will get that information posted. And I think that's about it. Oh, also, uh, Gilbert, or uh, uh, Dark Dancer, as he's known in the forum, he's the one that is helping with the chapter organization. And I believe after this radio show, he will be in Ventrilo doing chapter assessments. I can't make it today. It's, I, I hope we can actually move these to another day, simply because, because I'm, I'm literally working all day up until, up until uh, I get off the show. And I just I usually have all sorts of domestic things. I guess I do have, a, unfortunately, a normal life that I have to deal with. And today is, unfortunately, a day I have to go out and do things. Otherwise, I would join that meeting. But I'll talk to Gilbert about getting that on a different day. And eventually, we're going to divide the chapter meetings into international and domestic. And by the way, I want to thank all of the state chapters that have popped up since the last radio broadcast. That's been great. We're, we're slowly getting there. And I've seen great dedication with the state chapters. And that's going to be very important. Eventually, I would like to get the the leading parties of all state chapters together for a centralized meeting, and maybe even Canada as well, and uh, maybe some closer, well, I think that's probably ideal, like a North American meeting, so to speak, of those that are leading chapters uh, in these territories and states, and maybe all meet at the Venus Project or something to that effect. Or maybe it could happen around Zeitgeist Day, I'm not quite sure, but this is something that I've been talking to Jacques and Roxanne about, is to get a larger orientation for those that are very dedicated and focused, not just coming in and out of the forums. I mean, we have lots of people that are in the movement, but and sadly, there's only a small percentage that are really active, but that's okay. It's not sad, actually, at all. That's, I mean, this movement's only been around for nine months now, and I think there's been a tremendous amount of progress. Yeah, I think we get between 500 and 1,000 new members a day on average. Last I did the averaging, and uh, whether they're just people that are fly by night, I mean, they're still getting emails and things like that. Who knows what it takes to pull them in to get really focused but uh, we are still in our infancy, and I hope everyone understands that. Uh, we have a long way to go. When Zeitgeist 3 comes out, it's going to be another step. And um, a lot of the questions that keep coming up on this radio show, actually, radio show actually are ones that are going to be discussed thoroughly in that film, along with people with credentials and everything else that everyone keeps begging for. Um, in fact, uh, there's some questions in the Q&A I have in front of me that regards that. So let's just jump right into that. All right. <clears throat> Question number one. By the way, these are out of order from the forum. I prioritized them. Well, actually, they, they actually they I prioritized some of them, but they 
I had a, a glitch with my program. Everything got out of order, but I think they're comprehensible enough and in a decent order. Uh, number one, I am a fourth semester 25-year-old student in Boston pursuing a career as a singer. I took off six years after high school because I did not want to pay the ridiculous price of tuition, but society and many employers expect that people at least have a bachelor's degree. Did you attend college, Peter? If so, if so did you take out loans or how did you pay for it? What would you recommend to college students, especially musicians, artists like yourself, that have no guarantee of being able to pay off tens of thousands of dollars of debt upon graduating? I, well, you know, I really can't give you direct advice. I can tell you what my logic was, and you can, you can uh, gauge whether that relates to you. I did attend a music conservatory for two years, and uh, it wasn't up until last year that I finally paid off what it amounted to be, after the interest, about $60,000, $70,000 worth of debt. It's actually closer to eighty when you combine everything. Uh, from different aspects that were related to it, such as credit card debt, which was material because of because of problems with the actual loans. But anyway, I'm not going to go into all that. Uh, I, I dropped out after two years because I realized it was a degree in music for my purposes. I dropped out. I did independent things. I was fortunate to study with some guys from the New York Philharmonic for about six or seven years. And then I got to a point where I said to myself, you know, music is great. It's it's intuitively good. It's It helps someone's development cognitively in certain ways, but it's, there's a lot more important things in life. I would say that uh, you know, if you're going to go the exact, exact traditional route, then you might have to get a degree because that's the way the system works. But if you appreciate music just for the sake of music and you don't necessarily intend to have a full-on career in it, then I wouldn't recommend going into the type of debt that you will. Uh, staying out of debt is one of the most important things I think anyone can do. The moment you get into debt, and that's what the school system does, is the moment you're just ripe for what the industry needs. Because as long as you're in debt and you're willing to submit to servitude, you can be taken advantage of. It's no accident, as far as I'm concerned, that when people graduate from, high, excuse me, from college, that they're in the most debt they'll probably ever be in for the rest of them, their lives. Uh, because it's perfect for the establishment to continue its functionality. Number two, I've tried to convey the Zeitgeist Movement ideas to a lot of people, but the concept is hard to put in a single or even several sentences, do you think it is possible and plausible to come up with something like that, something one can use to introduce the matter? I wish it was that easy just to have a blanket statement. I mean, I, there are blanket statements that have been stated, excuse me, in, um, in the London presentation, there was opening statements, a few paragraphs long, I think, uh, summarized things. Jacques' book, of course, has a lot of great singular statements. Even on their website, there's good summary statements. But the problem is, is the context of those statements, to most people, it will just sound like Chinese because they don't understand, uh, uh, for lack of a better expression, by the way. If anyone's Chinese, I don't mean it to sound like your language is complex. But nevertheless, uh, it just it sounds extremely foreign because – because uh, they don't know the terminology. When you even use terms that Jock uses that you know, are typical terms, but you know, if people don't understand what, quote, the carrying capacity of the earth is, it's very difficult for you to talk about that. So what I would say is that, um, is that the Zeitgeist Movement is a social movement dedicated to updating, to updating society to modern-day knowledge for the betterment of the whole of humanity. We recognize that the majority of the social, physical, and psychological problems that plague humanity as a whole are a direct or indirect result of the real or artificial scarcity that's been created. In order to counter this, the foundation of our social structure must be reversed. The competitive labor-based monetary reward system does not work. It has worked only to a certain degree. It's never fully worked. We have to have a systems approach to the social structure. It is a round world. There's no real borders. There's, there's minerals and resources and energy deposits everywhere. You have to have a system to harness all of this to make it work in the most efficient way. So that's the way I would generally uh, say what the Zeitgeist Movement is about. Of course, there's many other aspects to it. There's, of course, the educational imperatives. There's the social understanding, the, the value system changes. We Unfortunately, people don't seem to understand that most of their values are outdated. And how do you tell people that their values are outdated without coming across as exceedingly arrogant? That's one of those difficult, difficult things to talk about. The question, I mean, how do you, value, how do you decide if a person's values are outdated? Well, you compare them to natural phenomena in the natural world, and you see if those values pose any positive effect. Do they, do they benefit anything tangibly? Are they functional in any way? 
And of course, when you get into religion and superstition, there's one side which the superstitious aspect of religion can be thrown out the window because it has, holds no functional relevance. In fact, it's a, it's a colossal hindrance. I think that can be proven equivocally. But on the other side, there is a moral quote. I don't again. I don't really believe in morality in the sense of uh, the traditional train of thought because it's tradition, and tradition is always going to be overcome in time. Tradition is by definition stagnant, and I don't. I'm not interested in tradition. But nevertheless, you know, there are moral implications, so to speak of religions, like reciprocation, you know, when Jacques was asked by Larry King what he thought of Christianity, Jacques stated that, I think it's great, when are they going to put it into practice? Of course, Jacques isn't referring to, you know, the death and the resurrection and all the superstitious stuff that's been derived from other religions. He's talking about the the practice, the moral practice of it. So from that angle, there is a position for certain values or reciprocal values, you know, but, but there's arbitrary values all over the place. Like people say, well, you should respect your parents. Why? Why should you respect your parents unless they're worthy of respect? Most parents I've met aren't worthy of that much respect. Uh, it, it, you have to put things into a tangible feedback-based context. People say uh, that people have the value system that everyone's entitled to their own opinion. Why? If someone puts a gun to your head and says, I'm entitled to my opinion to think that you should die, you're just going to let them shoot you because you think they're entitled to their opinion? No. Uh, the world doesn't work like that. But I'm going to leave it at that. I wish I could give you a better, um, a better singular statement. The Zeitgeist Movement wants to have a systems approach to society and evolve out of the competitive and detrimental patterns of behavior that we have now, which are, in fact, contrivances at this stage because of the vast magnitude and capacity of our technological understanding and also the understanding of the amazing amount of resources that we have on this planet that can take care of all of us if we had a systems approach to do so. So it's a holistic thing. And of course, even when you say that, and I'm sorry to go on a tangent here, even when you say that to people, their value systems kick in too, because most people, unfortunately, think they're better than everybody else. This is uh, another powerful neuroses that's been concocted. All religions think that. The entire basis of class thinks that. The very first value, value adaptation that has to occur is people need to understand that they're not any better than anyone else or anything in existence. There's no such thing as such a, such a qualifier in and of themselves. It's only when you get into practice of certain attributes that somebody might have a stronger position than somebody else. For example, if someone has an amazing proficiency in physics and engineering, well, that's the person that would be ideal to construct, say, bridges or anything that would be relevant to any kind of uh, social architecture, as opposed to somebody else who studies just electrical engineering. They would be working on the internals of the structure that the other individual built. Those are the only elements of quality you can come up with. Obviously, there's a quality to someone, quality differentiation between somebody who sits on a couch all day and has been aberrantly conditioned to drink beer and watch television for eight hours a day, as opposed to somebody who has thousands of, excuse me, has dozens of great hobbies and, you know, does plenty of things, is socially active, and they, they use their mind and they think and they, because their conditioning has allowed them to culminate a worldview and a perspective that actually finds reward in work and, and uh, contributions to society and things like that. But in and of themselves, no one is better than anyone else. And that's, that is just something that people are going to have to understand. It's, uh, there's no way the world is ever going to function in a clean way if uh, people continue to put themselves on high horses and unfortunately, this system rewards that. I hope that's relatively clear. There's a lot more I could say on that, actually, but I'm, I'm going to stop there because I want to try and get to these questions. Number three, given that the third world nations are much farther behind us in terms of relevant education, technological development, and scientific understanding, how will the Venus Project address bringing them forward in a positive and constructive way so that their understanding of the scientific method and their application of technological advancement isn't too overwhelming for them? That's an interesting question. Um, I think the issue comes down to familiarization and, of course, uh, breaking the barriers of cultural tradition. There's always going to be people, Luddites, so to speak, they are going to be against anything new. Um, 
unfortunately, that is a value system that is very much dominant, that people were, some people are just terrified of any form of change. I think in the third world, once they're shown that they can eat and they can have energy and they can have a, a standard of living where they don't have to collect water and bring it all the way back to, to, a, to a dilapidated structure for many of them in the, in the ghettos, and they you know, cook with it, and they have to go to outhouses. Once they understand that all of the general con- simplistic conveniences can be made available to them, and no one has to starve, or they can get good medical attention and everything else, I, I, that type of technological development, which seems simplistic to us, when implemented, might seem very, very foreign to some of these cultures that are deprived. Remember, I believe it's less than 40% of the world uh, has ever used a telephone. That's a statistic I had from 2001. And that, that's profound if you really think about that and all the things that we take advantage of in our Western society. So it's all a matter of adaptation. I think uh, once the fruits of technology show themselves, people will not think twice. I think people take for granted the world around them. They think that we live in a non-technological society. Everything is run by computers today. Um, just take a step back one day and just look around at walk down the street and look at what technology has done and look at what we consider to be primitive now, which, which would have been absolutely uh, stunning and staggering and almost scary to people in, uh, say, two, three, four hundred years ago. So anyway, to answer your question, I think that once they see the merit and they understand the merit, the, the adapt- adaptation will happen naturally. Number four, will people be smart enough to design holistic systems without leaving a mark of latent frustration upon populations? I have run across many automated systems that are really not seamless for use by humans and thus annoying to anyone willing to just do manual labor. That's an interesting color to your question. Uh, Well, as with anything, development is constant. Uh, You know, there's no such thing as, as... a perfect anything. Perfection doesn't really exist. And, you know, problems will always emerge through anything. There's always going to be problems. And we've always, I think we've talked about this. There's no utopia. There's no such thing. It depends on what degree and what relative association you have to the problems that you're talking about, these latent frustrations. In the modern day today, with the cost-cutting mechanism, with the constant element of money being utilized to reduce efficiency, because that's what it does. I think that none of the automated systems that are in existence today could come close to what they could be. Uh, those automated systems that serve a larger function, uh, say if you go to an automation plant in Japan, uh, these are extremely advanced robotic systems that they have to create automobiles. And uh, if you walk through one of these things, I've never walked through one, but I've seen uh, documentaries on them, and I've just been, it's absolutely unbelievable. You have managers that can basically oversee the entire thing, and that's all they really need. There's no manual labor. It's all robotics. Now, take away the cost mechanism from that scenario, that advanced scenario, I think you could have it even more advanced because there's no reason for the engineer of those robots to have to cut corners to sell them. They're not making things to sell. They're making things to work, and there's a massive, massive difference. I think even in the highest echelon of the robotics industry, such as I just, the example I just gave, there's still forms of planned obsolescence and a deliberate withholding of efficiency because they're cutting corners financially to produce these items so they can sell them. And I believe in the back of their minds, they want aftermarket value as well. So there is a, either a conscious or subconscious tendency to make things a little bit shoddy so the company will come back and get replacement parts and everything that's required. So you know, back to your point, I think the system we live in today, this demographic-based system, where uh, the stratification requires different tiers of quality because that's where the selling points are, that you don't see what's actually possible. And uh, I think that's really what it comes down to. I'm certainly not satisfied with all the automation systems I see today. They could be highly streamlined, but that's what you have to keep in mind is they can be streamlined. And there will always be problems. But uh, once the society is turned around to focus on automation as opposed to automation being this subtle threat to the labor force, which it has been for the past 80 years. That's the way it's been viewed by labor unions since the Great Depression. Once the focus shifts and say, okay, we are going to focus all energy on making automation the pinnacle labor mechanism. Once that happens, you're going to see no reason for uh, the laziness to occur in any, any construction of anything. And the number of mines that will be working on it will, be, will, be, uh, will maximize the intellectual awareness of it and, of course, make it more efficient and more productive. 
so I have very little very little fear that uh, that uh, that just won't work or uh, there'll be a lack of seamlessness. I mean, again, if you look around today, there's a tremendous amount of seamlessness that you don't see because it's that seamless as far as general operations of electricity and all sorts of things that I, I don't want to go into because I'm only on question five and we're almost half an hour into the show. Number five, who designs the machines in such a way that it, excuse me, such a way that is completely impervious to tampering we all know that there are unequivocally beneficial functions of technology, but I think there will have to be some kind of peer review system that makes sure the technology does what it's supposed to. For instance, I had an idea for creating a water analyzing machine that detects all known components of non-biological benefit. But what is to prevent someone from developing this to lie to its user, displaying that nothing is wrong when in reality there is? Well, I think uh, you raised two interesting points. The peer review system is inherent. It, all, all systems are the result of many minds, and they also would be immediately available for public consumption, meaning that if you had the awareness of mathematics and physics and the type of blueprint construction programs that would be required to build whatever mechanism machine you're doing. Naturally, even today, most machines are constructed through computers I may, and eventually computers will help with the design aspect. In fact, there's already uh, examples of that occurring, meaning that they can begin to think about what you're doing. The peer, peer review system is inherent. So that's, it's not just one person doing things. It's always open for public consumption, and everyone puts their input. That's the beauty of not having patents and not having restrictions on ideas. In this type of system where things are open, everyone can contribute their ideas to make the best of the best. I think there will be a great interest to do so, and the reward will come from the satisfaction that that machine operates in the best way that it can. As far as your other issue, your criminal, the criminality issue, is what is to prevent somebody from developing it to lie, the real question is why would someone want to develop the machine to lie? If the system is holistically based or everyone is tied in to the system's mechanisms, Everyone gets the rewards of the system, and there's no differential advantage. In other words, there's no stratified aspect to this whatsoever. There's no reason for someone to get one up on somebody else. If someone was to make a machine that lies, it's just going to be found out it doesn't work, and it's going to be replaced because there's nothing to gain. There's no money in the system. This is one of the most powerful points that people still fail to understand within the movement when they talk about corruption, is that if there's nothing to reward the corruption, the corruption does not exist. Why would it? I'm not saying that all aspects of corruption disappear because of the remove, removal of the monetary system and deliberate creation of abundance through automation. No, there's always going to be general problems. Again, this isn't a utopia. But when it comes to the mechanism that is the most predominant, as I'm sure you'll see in Michael Moore's new film, I'm always probably going to go after are the greed mechanisms that continue to prevail. And why do they prevail? Because they're rewarded. In the Venus Project resource-based economy, that mechanism is history. And that is a powerful thing that people need to understand. People will only be corrupt if there's a reward for such corruption. So to make a machine that lies does absolutely nothing. It actually hurts the individual that's in association because he's the one that's going to be benefiting off of that machine just like everybody else is in the system. There's no detachment. Number six, in preparing the population to accept a resource-based economy, what steps do you think would be best taken at the initial part of the transition phase. With the level of technology currently available, would it be possible to take one of Jacques Fresco's smaller ideas and inventions to fund a large, larger scale project with the view to raising awareness and setting an example on a greater scale? A project with one of the leading problems in mind, such as creating an abundance of energy and food. I think something like this could generate a lot of positive media and success would ease and success would ease skepticism in those who are doubtful of the Venus Project's practicality. Do you think we'll be able to implement something like this fairly early, or do you think we'll be more concentrated, concerned, excuse me, with knowledge and spreading information for quite a while? Okay, there's a few points you're addressing here. Um, as far as using one of Fresco's ideas to fund something on a larger scale, that's something that uh, I've overheard people, heard Jacques and Roxanne talk about. Jacques doesn't want to Jacques doesn't see the merit in doing so at this stage. That's not his focus. Um, it, the real question is, what is the larger project? Of course, that's the test city system. 
that's uh, the first step, really. As far as your your point here about creating an abundance of energy and food, well, that would be fantastic. But we could only create that in a limited limited space because of the way the world is currently organized financially. Uh, that's a, just a colossal thing. I mean, we can prove that we can create. I mean, it's already provable the abundance of energy. It's just a matter of harnessing the technology to do it. Everything's energy. And as far as food, that's easy enough as well. And I think uh, there's another question I can talk about that later. And all you do is go straight into the ocean and take out the organic matter and pump them into hydroponic systems, and you could grow virtually anything that's uh, vegetative uh, in essentially skyscrapers if you wanted to. There'd probably be easier means to do it. Uh, you wouldn't need any type of hormonal aspect. All aspects of, this is a tangent, by the way, but all aspects of modification would be out the window unless it was absolutely natural. You want to return to the natural state of things, not this use of technology to create an abundance for industry, which is what's happening now. Companies like Monsanto that can genetically engineer seeds so they only have one lifespan, which is absolutely insane. But let me get back to your question. So basically, you know, if Fresco came up with an invention that he wanted to sell, which is really against his entire basic ethic, uh, to fund something, better yet, you know, if, if money was, if, when money is needed, then a project will be funded. The biggest one, of course, is the city system. We couldn't just create, we could create the blueprints for the create, creating the abundance of energy and food. In fact, what I'd like to see is a uh, schematic done of food processes that come um, in extruded form. In other words, you condense, you condense food and you extract the minerals and nutrients and you put them in, in what is typically defined as space food, casually speaking. And then you figure out how much it would cost to create enough to, say, feed a billion people, the billion people starving. This is a massive transition point. If we ever got to a point where uh, the transition was in operation and we did, have, we did have power to do something, then the first thing you would do is create this type of food substance that would be sent to everyone in the third world so they don't have to worry about getting their nutrients. It wouldn't be the most flavorful thing, but they would be taken care of. That's a project. That's something that uh, if, if it was done financially, in other words, if you schematic, schematic it out, and it's something I've thought about, you found a company that does these types of things. You figure out how much it costs to do it. You, you consider it at a bulk rate, and you figure out how many millions, hundreds of millions of dollars most likely it would take to create enough food for you know, a billion people to live off of for a year. Uh, that would be an interesting project because if it was under a certain value, it would probably deeply offend most people on the planet because of all the other things that we spend money on. In fact, there's another subject here throughout the questions. Another question that's in here about this point, about our priorities, and I'll get to that one in a moment, but uh, our priorities are absolutely backwards. Uh, we can't even take care of ourselves on this planet, and yet we, the scientists are in these bubbles, and they focus on things that, while I, I'm, I appreciate their art, they focus on things that have absolutely no social relevance whatsoever. But again, that's a tangent, so let me make sure I answered all of your questions. Uh, to summarize your question and answer, I would say that we still have to be concerned with spreading information. But making examples of, uh, of what can be done in some form, especially socially relevant ones, is important. I think all of you can take, take time to think about those things. In fact, the Zeitgeist Media Project would be great if someone was to write an essay, a statistical essay. In fact, I might attempt to do this a statistically-based essay which denotes how we could use this resource and this resource to make the type of food product I'm describing which could be made available continually for those impoverished on this planet. Things like that. And you could apply that logic to, to just about anything, you know. Number seven, in order, to get, in order to get the volume of people you'd like, you'd have to have this movement flourish. We need something tangible to show them. I think this goes back to the prior question, but I'll read it. Uh, we have to show them that it can work. Fancy drawings and big ideas are one thing, but reality is something else. Once the place becomes so real, how does their belief, excuse me, once the place becomes real, so does their belief in the concept. What does this mean? It means we need money. We need a full-fledged 501c nonprofit. We need grassroots organizers to lead volunteers. We need tons of flyers, DVDs, information. We need big-time developers, engineers. Da, 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 da. Isn't it time for us to stop bickering about who said what in the forum and start taking, taking the fight to these arrogant elitists? Uh, I, I completely agree with you. The Venus Project has a 501c, and, and they are basically they have the entire framework for everything that really needs to be done as far as the financial aspect. Uh, I'm not sitting here telling people that uh, just give money to them. 
uh, anything helps, and it's definitely going into good use. And when a larger project comes around, such as land being donated and the first test city being built, then a massive fundraising project will be underway. But I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to instigate any blind fundraising for the sake of fundraising until it has somewhere to go. And I know some of you out there disagree with that, but uh, I'm not. The fundraising is really the least of my concerns, believe it or not. What I want is your time, not your money. So you mentioned you know volunteers, flyers, DVDs. This is what everyone should be doing. This is what uh, this is what it's about. You have to engage the people. And once enough people are in support of it, then there will be a basis of get of getting money to help fund the first test city. And then there will already be a general interest. And when the first test city occurs, yes, it will be very important. No one's saying that that's not going to happen. And I say this to a lot of you out there that seem frustrated. Again, the movement's only been around eight, nine months. Uh, we have a long way to go. Does that mean that things are just not going to happen? No, not at all. It's up to you to make things happen. The financial aspect is always there, but I'm not pushing it right now because there's tons of other value aspects that we have to deal with. But we'll get there. Number eight, how do you feel about tests and simulations being used to determine if an individual possesses the qualifications necessary to fulfill a role? Well, of course. I mean, obviously, obviously the educational system serves a similar role to what it does now, except it doesn't have the financial aspect. It's focused on natural processes. It's focused on relevant things that have to do with living, have to do with the way that people see the world, the way that they see each other. And qualifications to fill a role, you know, people will people will engage scientific interests, and they will they will go through tests and processes and learning learning aspects just like everybody else. Though I have a feeling when it comes to testing and things like that, it'll be very very different from what people experience today. I think uh, rather than people have a general understand people having a general understanding of you know history and the, well, history of course is important, but have it, if you have asked the general person what their basic understanding is, very few of them have any basis in science or mathematics or or the um, anything that's related to creation, um, they they are unfortunately groomed into a specific niche, and they have a very specific concentration, and mainly because they have to have a job in that area. So an electrician has a sense of science, but he's an electrician; he's forced into one specific field. And I think in time, people will be a little bit more general; they'll be a little bit more broad, and uh, they'll have a greater awareness. And of course, they'll always be experts too. They're those that do have specialization. I'm not saying specialization won't exist. That's, of course, required, too. I'm on a little bit of a tangent here, but um, to answer your question very simplistically, of course. I mean, obviously, people are reviewed, and they have to show, uh, they have to show that they can do what they, what they set out to do. In time, however, this will be paired up with computers. I think in time, computers will literally be side by side with humans at mostly all times when it comes to decision-making processes. The decision-making process will be novel from, from the individual standpoint, and it will be inserted into a system that can make and understand the issue at hand. So if an individual wants to invent something, he interfaces with a system that is designed to be, quote, an expert, at least in content, of what that in individual is attempting to go for. And that's uh, what we've talked about. That's in the manual. So, yes, I mean, people's value will be based on, not value, excuse me, people's understanding. The value of their understandings will be based on their interactions with the systems, and the systems will be able to tell very easily if they're qualified to make decisions or not because the systems, idealistically, in time, will be able to see the errors that the individual is inputting. That's, a, of course, you know, a complex one. People will get all sci-fi on you when you try to say things like that, but if you read people like, Ray Kurzweil and all these other individuals that have dealt with programming languages and they've dealt with artificial intelligence, you see that this really is right around the corner. I mean, we already interface with computers all day long. Uh, you know, that's, that is the new nature of the game. And it's, it's not something to be shunned. It's not, uh, we shouldn't be ludites about it. Computers are tools that we've created. They don't have a life of their own. And we, they're extensions of us just like our arms and just like a pencil. Nothing, nothing different. Number nine... You've stated on multiple occasions that the hypothetical circular city inhabitants would be conditioned to behave in certain ways. How specifically would humans addicted to a monetary society be re-educated? I'm not quite sure where to begin with um, the semantic issues of, of this question. Well, first of all, uh, the hypothetical circular city is just a city. 
it's not the it's not the value system based society. The inhabitants aren't conditioned to behave in certain ways because it doesn't have anything to do with the city. In other words, it's not the circular city and then behavior. We're talking about a value shift of culture. The cities are actually rather arbitrary in that sense, even though the cities will they will uh, compound and reinforce the value systems because of the way they're constructed in the holistic egalitarian style with access, not monetary barter or trade. So, um, and then you ask, how would humans addicted to a monetary society be re-educated? Re-educated is one of those loaded words you hear a lot of people against the movement say that we're trying to re-educate people. Well, there's no such thing as re-education. All there is is education. Education uh, it can't be stopped. It has nothing to do with re-education. There's plenty of things that we think and then we learn and grow out of. We learn that they're wrong. That's not re-education. That's just education. So that's the terminology that should be used. People will be educated because they'll be able to see the value of the system. They will overcome their value distortions and their indoctrinations through time. Of course, I know it's difficult, but they'll be able to see that what they have previously thought hasn't served to function, and what is, what is gaining feedback from the environment, what is rewarding everybody, uh, does have a basis. In other words, it will be a natural prog progression to, to bring to the forefront technological progress for the betterment of everyone in society and to develop value systems that favor that type of system. Again, it's a tough point, but uh, education is not just about numbers and processes. It's also about values. Uh, as we've d discussed repeatedly, value systems are taught. And if you want to be corrupt and competitive and um, self-interested, narrow self-interest, that is a, a state that is basically created that you've fallen into. And likewise, if obviously that 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 frame of reference actually works in our current system, that's why the wealthiest people tend to be the most ruthless and the most most immoral, as you know, denoted by the personalities I talk about in Zeitgeist Part One, or that John Perkins talks about. And you know, it, it's just what the system rewards. So, to answer your question, how would humans addicted to the monetary system be be essentially unconditioned? Is what you're basically saying? Be educated they would experience the system and understand it. They would understand how it's working and they would be able to compare that with their prior education. Again, there's a lot more I could say on that because it's so open-ended what you're asking because there's so many avenues, but I'm going to leave it at that. We have to gauge feedback from the environment for our decision-making processes. The, the age of uh, just everyone blatantly thinking whatever they want to think, meaning that we just we just – engage everybody as though everyone is equal in their in their experience of particular fields and that is that's that's ridiculous i mean the example i've given before imagine you having open heart surgery doctors want a democratic perspective of of excuse me they want to engage a dem democratic decision making process amongst the audience that's watching the surgery your family members and your aunts and your uncles they have no education in it so they why should they have any decision-making process? Would you really want people that have no decision-making awareness, excuse me, no education in a particular field to decide your move, excuse me, your next surgical move during your open-heart surgery? Of course not. And that's exactly the same problem that happens with our illusion of democracy today. It's no surprise that even with the civil rights movement, with African Americans being allowed to vote, with women rights and women now being uh, being able to vote and all that process of voting and the restriction of all that crap that ever happens since the Constitution. You know, originally you had to be a landowner to vote. Uh, all that stuff is gone. But has anything really changed? No, because the value systems are the same. It doesn't matter who, if it's a woman or if someone of a different race. Value systems are still generally, on average, the same. So the same the same people get into the White House over and over and over again. The same mechanisms are constantly occurring. So democracy isn't uh, democracy is in its abstract sense a joke. It can't work because it's based on uh, it's based on this blind notion that everyone has a right to think whatever they want to think, regardless of feedback from the environment. If they can think it all they want. This isn't an oppressive type of notion, but their ability to act on those notions has to be related to the environment and feedback. And that is why the computer system that we talk about, that's based entirely on formal logic, will be applied to people's decision-making processes. I hope that makes sense. Number 10, I live on a beautiful island where practices such as organic gardening and Permaculture are the norm. Much of the island is left in its natural forest state, and part of the economy 
and part of the economy happens with cooperatives and barter. I have screened Zeitgeist Addendum for some of my neighbors, and they agree with most of it, but they get turned off by the idea of more and more technology. They feel that being deeply connected with the natural world is the only hope for humanity. Is your vision of the natural world mainly a source of resources for a resource-based economy, or would a few special areas be preserved as parks, or would everything outside the high-tech cities be reverted as close to their original state as possible? Well, I'll go backwards. Um, yeah, so Fresco has denoted that we have to return the natural environment. The natural environment, of course, supports us. The ecosystems are, of course, always in a delicate balance. We return Everything returns to nature. We get away from all of these contrived practices. Uh, the high-tech cities really are actually very natural cities. They're high-tech, but they're not artificially high-tech. They're not, they're not cold. There's a functional utility that is ever apparent in nature, but it's simply exasperated, so to speak, well, at least for the view of some people, more of a Luddite perspective, exasperated. That's a wrong word. Let me step back. It's, it seems extreme because of, because of the, um, the nature of our current system. And, and, of course, if you live on an island where it's very, very natural and everyone's growing things, then naturally it would, it would seem very foreign to people to have high-tech maglev trains riding over them and things like this. So I guess my point is, is that I don't see a difference. It's all a matter of culture. Um, people would say a light bulb today is primitive. Uh, but if you brought a light bulb to some Amazonian culture, they might think you're, a, you know, maybe not today. They might probably most all of them have an understanding of what a light bulb is. But back when uh, this was still fairly new, but still early to us, the, these cultures might be terrified of such such a device. You never know. They might consider it an atrocity. If there's some out there that might still think that everyone should just grow food on land, but unfortunately we can't do that anymore. The population is too large. Uh, there's always the debate that is it high tech or low tech that we need, and I think it's a high tech minimalism that's really a, it's a conservative form of high tech. And I don't think that the society at large, the world population, will be sustained by our current methods. We can't return back to to the early days. The population is too large for that. We have to move forward, and there's no reason we should want to return. Progress is always moving. Uh, there's, again, there's an underlying order of emergence and change and development, and I think even with uh, the island that you speak of, I guarantee you if you come back to that island in 100 years, regardless of, of the notions of what we describe, it's going to undergo a great deal of change, most likely, uh, through intellectual development, uh, through experience. It's just, a, it's just the way it is. But I can relate to that issue, sort of a Luddite concern that technology is unnatural or that uh, it's just foreign to the culture. I'm going to leave it at that because that's really what it comes down to. You'd be surprised how fast people can change their, their uh, perspective, especially when it has a benefit to them. I mean, I was reading in the book on technological unemployment about the first refrigerators that came forward. And there were women that were interviewed when this was occurring, the electric refrigerator, and they said that they refused to get the refrigerator because they liked talking to the ice man, the man that would bring the ice, put it in the ice box for them. Because, they, of course, if you remember, they had ice boxes, they little metal things. You stick a big block of ice in I think it lasted for a week or something. And uh, that was the method. And there's, a, there's a romanticism, and I understand that, but uh, what can you do? I mean, just because that's the pattern doesn't mean it has to stay there forever. It's not going to stay there forever. Nothing is going to stay anyway forever. Number 11, at the end of the first zeitgeist, the quote, quote, absolute power corrupts absolutely was shown. Uh, in this future world, isn't that going to bring absolute power who corrupts absolutely? Uh, this goes back to my other point. There's no basis for power because there's no reward for it. You can't hijack the system because there's nothing to gain. All you do is shut down shut down your own processes. You can't isolate yourself from it. You're in it. So, you know, the absolute power has to do with power itself. Yes, absolute power does corrupt absolutely. People that have power want more and more power. And uh, in our current system, by all means, in the monetary system, that is absolutely the case. But uh, that statement is a little vague. In fact, I, would, I might even change that statement if I was to change the first film uh, based on what I understand now because it's taken out of context, of course. Just because there's a systems approach to an organization, meaning that there's a holistic organization from top to bottom, and there is at some point a high level which has an organizational capacity to take, take control, so to speak, or monitor everything that's happening, doesn't necessarily mean some human's going to get in that position and mess everything up. In fact, the transparency of the system is one of the most uh, interesting things. One thing I'll point out in Zeitgeist Addendum is the holographic nature of the communication systems that will be utilized meaning that every single city 
every single co- country or whatever whatever the uh, barrier, excuse me, whatever the distinctions are to denote region, I don't think borders will exist. Uh, but they could have names for countries. It really doesn't matter. The uh, every system, I say cities would be the easiest example, has the same holographic imagery and same setup as every other city. And there's an interconnectivity of communication between all systems. And it works on two basic levels. You have the nervous system aspect where the computerized system reacts without anybody's need to interfere with it because it knows how to regulate everything to keep things optimal as far as optimum efficiency, as far as production, distribution, resource allocation, resource management. All of that is a technical process. Then there's the event inventive level. There's the higher level, and that's where humans are engaging the system and they're making alterations or updating things and things like that. That will all come from an obvious awareness of all parties involved on the planet. I, granted, is only not everyone would want to be involved in that. And once a system like this is going, it's not going to require as much. Um, it's not going to sound as difficult or as. Um, I don't. I don't believe it will be as daunting a task as people might consider it. If you look at it, just because the planet seems very large to us, doesn't necessarily mean it is. If a systems approach could easily work for a small machine, the same way it could work holistically for the entire planet. Now, I've deviated from your question as far as the basis of power, power corrupting. Even if somebody was able to, say, hijack the system, what are they going to do with it? What can they possibly do? And in the event of some type of turbulent aspect like that, I, I don't see how people would not rise up and take control back over their system. It, it's not like today. It's nothing, nothing like today. There isn't that mechanism of money to manipulate every variable. There's no, there's no path for corruption. All of that's gone. It's a holistic system of access based on the support of everyone. Number 12. Hi, Peter. As part of an ongoing on-site research into the generating of resource-based economy within experimental communities, what would you say to the thousands, perhaps millions, of religious-minded people who believe positive change can only come from an increased spiritual focus rather than from a focus on organizing material resources. I have met many people who believe such uh, who believe any such progress progressive priority sorry this sentence is bizarre. I have met many who believe any such progressive priority humanity needs to first focus within before focusing on external resources. Okay. Well, first of all, you can't internally think yourself out of a box. You know that, notice I use Jito Krishnamurti, who is a great internal thinker. He really had an amazing awareness of internal awareness, excuse me, of thought processes that are inherent to the human. He, was, he felt you could do it from within. And I agree with him only to a certain degree, because when you understand that there isn't some empirical cell within you that has all the information in the world, it doesn't quite work like that. When you realize that, you understand that the, you're basically culminated through conditioning. Krishnamurti understood this too, but he always had an issue of, of the self and the person and the realization, which I think is actually extremely viable. Um, I would say that um, it's two levels and it's sort of a gray area. You have, if you are in a, are you trapped into a particular structure, say you're trapped in a box, you can't just think your way out of it unless you know the tools, unless you have the awareness of how to get out of the box. In other words, if you don't understand it, you can't link onto a processes that will culminate that logical conclusion, then you're, you're hopeless. You're, and you're limited in that box because you have no outside information. So at that stage, the internal mechanism has no basis because you don't have the tool. On the other example, there is the fact that if the system, if it's just the system's effect on the individual as opposed to the individual's effect on the system. If it's just the system's effect on the individual, which of course is true too, I'd say that's actually the first step, be honest more than anything else, then you eliminate the decision-making processes of the individual and you condemn the person to just being a robot in a highly simplistic way. I do believe people are essentially robots, but they also have decision-making processes. Let me see if I can explain this well enough. You are a conglomerate of logical processes based on input and tools that the environment has given you. So that's basically it. And I think that people have a lot more tools, believe it or not, than they realize because their value systems break you down. Their value systems lock you up. So even if you understand the physics very well and you understand um, 
you know, the the basic fundamentals of evolution, and you accept that in, say, your general, you know, if you're a high school student in a high school history class, excuse me, high school science class, but yet you go and you're very religious, your parents are very religious, and they indoctrinate you into this belief system, you're locked into a strange tether of awareness. In fact, as a, as a specific aside, I, I just thinking about Krishnamurti, he always had this great example he used to talk about religion, and he said, religion is like a ball tied to a stake. Or, in fact, it was a person, but he used an example. Basically, a person tied to a stake in a middle, with, a, with a tether in, you know, somewhere. So the person is tied to a stake that's pinned, and he can, say he has a 20-foot radius, he can walk around that stake, he can go back and forth from the, from the, the radius of the stake and uh, back to the edge of the circle that he's being locked into, but that's as far as he can go, and that's the basis of religious thought, is you're locked into a specific, specific area of reference. And that's really the important aspect here. So the issue comes down to the fact that we need to think about what we've come to understand and internalize and, you know, be introspective, but also take in new information constantly. And there's always a con- combination of the two. There are people that have logical processes that uh, have a, uh, can come up with conclusions that others cannot with the same information. That's just the basis of experience. We're all novel in that sense. So that's that's basically the way I would summarize that, and I hope that makes sense. Number 13. Lately, while listening to radio addresses, I have noticed some emotionally charged blanket statements about people in society calling them dumbed down and ignorant, so forth. I also heard Jacques say that, quote, you have to be a pinhead not to see the contradictions in the Bible, unquote. I do not believe in the Bible or Christianity or religion in general, which is why I feel compelled to make this observation and get your thoughts on it. Do you think it's constructive in keeping with the philosophy of the movement to speak in such emotionally charged, unscientific statements? Do you feel it is important to maintain an absolute scientific disposition? Well, that's a good, that's a good call out, and I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. Uh, scientific dispositions, of course, are always the way to go, but they tend in this culture not to be the most communicatively effective. There's a reason why religion is so powerful. It's not because of the writings per se that are in the book. It's not because of the reciprocal morality. It's because of the art and influence and emotionality that's been put forward. So when someone is expressive in a blanket type of element, meaning, say, I call somebody stupid, well, you have to know what I mean by that. I don't believe someone's born stupid. I believe they're culminated to be stupid. I believe, in part, that they have a subtle responsibility for that stupidity, in part, as going back to the prior question. But they're also a product of their culture and conditioning. So someone who's in the KKK, I would consider essentially stupid because they're basing a philosophy on something that has no positive benefit to the environment socially. And even though they understand perhaps the fact that genetically speaking, all races are basically the same, if races were not the same, we wouldn't be able to uh, breed with each other. As far as I'm concerned, I mean, many generations from now, there'll be no such thing as races. Everyone will have finally bred with each other, and it will just be a big melting pot. But be that as it may, if someone actually believes in racial distinction, someone that's a racist, well, they've been most likely conditioned into that train of thought, and then emotional attachments come up, and it becomes both an internal and an external struggle for, for them to overcome that uh, incorrect disposition. So the point I'm trying to make is that blanket emotional statements, I could just say something you know, very intellectual, but for me to say something subtly derogatory to get your attention it does have a position. And I don't plan to do that. I just get emotional like everybody else. I'm not a computer, and Josh's not a computer either. So, you know, you know, it, you, <laughs> there, I wasn't very happy with myself when I called an individual radio host, show, uh, talk show host, uh, a fucking lunatic uh, when I was in London. But it was an emotionally charged issue, and that's the way I felt at that moment. It's just the basic element of your sad emotional disposition. It's a flaw of our individuality. It's also one of our greatest... Uh, also one of our greatest strengths as far as how do we relate to each other. Emotion has both a positive and negative aspect. Um, I think emotion tends to get in the way more than anything else, and I'm guilty of that just like everybody else. Uh, I think Jacques put it well when emotion, describing emotion is like putting your foot down on a gas pedal while the car is not in gear. And going back to Dr. Robert Sapolsky, we have the ability to create emotional environments in our brains that other species would laugh at and try to figure out what the hell's wrong with us. We're all neurotic. We can conjure up emotional anger and emotional issues out of the blue, out of memory. And uh, for most of the animal kingdom, that doesn't exist. 
when a zebra is being chased by a lion, it has an immediate stress response. And once it's away from that, it's, it doesn't think anything of it. It doesn't sit there and, and shake about being scared or anything like that. I mean, of course, if it got injured, there's other trauma that can go with that. But it's on a per-case basis. Humans are very different. We can just conjure these things up. I mean, I don't know of any other animal that really can do that. Things, obviously, animals get scared, but humans are different. So what was my point? I don't even remember. Basically, I try to ignore the blanket statements. But if you listen to me or Jacques long enough, you know that when these statements are made, they're not stated in just a blind, narrow way. And I'll do my best not to state things like that. It's just you can get frustrated, and sometimes you want to make a point. And rather than go on a long dissertation about the value of this and the value of that, sometimes it's a little bit easier just to make a solid, singular statement that holds strength, that people will understand your disposition, even if it's not complete. And sometimes that takes the form of something that would be considered derogatory. But uh, I will uh, do my best not to do that, but I think uh, we all do it, and I think there's a, there's a commonality to it, and we can identify with it. When I hear someone curse or, you know, someone be very real and get slightly frustrated, I know I'm dealing with someone who's most likely um, real, meaning that they, they really believe in what they're talking about, as opposed to just blanket intellectual dissertation. You can not only does that become, not only does that become very boring, it can also give a feeling of me- mechanization where the person might just be reciting something he doesn't actually believe in. So... I could go on a number of different points on that, but I think that's that's suffice to say it. Absolute scientific disposition is, of course, the best way to go. But certain people require certain forms of communication. I will talk to somebody who is very derogatory, you know, from the inner cities that curses all the time, very, very different than I'll talk to a PhD. And, and I think uh, that's sort of the way the communication has to work, unfortunately. Where was I here? Number 14... Do, 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 do. do you think that we will be seeing the collapse of the monetary system in our time? I think we're seeing the collapse of the monetary system now. I think uh, the, it, it most likely can salvage itself, but it's only going to salvage itself in certain areas. The poverty is going to increase substantially. Uh, the bank failures are going to continue for a little while, but the banks could survive. The businesses are still failing. The real issue to me is the awareness of what it means for the system to collapse and how it relates to the world as a whole. I think the system's already utterly collapsed. What what I mean by collapse is that it's already failed one-sixth, more than one-sixth of the world population definitively. We live in a global monetary system, and yet six billion, excuse me, one billion people are starving to death. So that's a collapse in my mind. That's an absolute failure. Unfortunately, in the Western world, we don't see that. We don't see that. As far as the labor system, by all means, there's no way that the labor system is going to continue without imposed socialism. They're going to start creating weird forms of socialism through time to compensate for technological unemployment. Uh, the, I'm going to have a whole bunch of information on this in Zeitgeist 3, so I hope, um, I, hope uh, I can get that relayed more cleanly at that point. So I hope, hope that makes that clear as far as my disposition on the collapse of the monetary system. It's going to get worse, but it, could, it might get better for like you know some – some of the other Western countries, but doesn't the rest of the planet's going to keep suffering? There's just no way around it because there's no projects there to to uh, intercept that. The United Nations doesn't care. Uh, the it's just unbelievable when you think about what's tolerated on the globe, and you, people just turn the channel. They just change the channel on television, and they can blindly not witness uh, what's actually happening. <coughs> Excuse me. Remember, Number 15, are Africa or parts of tropical Ecuadorian, excuse me, equatorial South America viable areas to initiate or try to apply the principles of a resource-based economy, considering that many of these areas have a great amount of natural resources, plenty of sunlight, et cetera, and also they are relatively underdeveloped. I've, as I've said before, Latin and South America, I think, are ideal. There's lots of open space. There's a tremendous amount of natural resources. And people, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening in Latin America. If we can get a country behind it or, or a bunch of countries behind it just to build the first city, that would be the most optimum first step. Rather than just building an arbitrary a test city somewhere, if we can get a test city in a place where the, the president or, or whomever is in advocation, at least on some degree, granted it's a massive step even for any of these countries, uh, just to let it happen. To, to engage the, the fundamentals of this and to support it and, of course, protect it, 
if that's going to be required, uh, then that's going to be the best thing that can happen. And I'm, I've been talking – well, I'm not going to go into all of that. Number 16, on the 816 – excuse me, on the 826 radio address, there was much discussion about ornamentation. Please explain the Zeitgeist Movement view of art and beauty. It sounded that – it sounded as though a woman, quote, being deceitful – a woman is, quote, being deceitful by wearing eyeliner was lumped together with art, music, and beauty in general. One could argue any person being clothed is deceitful, hiding their bodies. Anyone using motorized transport is just fooling us. They're meant to get around on foot or horses. <laughs> it seems common sense that we need to find a balance. If we can have ornamentation without greed or destruction, without wasting time and resources, what's the harm? I am 100% in agreement with you. I think you kind of answered your own question. It's really just a question of balance. And that's all we were talking about on that show. I mean, if you, you know, functionality is really what it comes down to. What is functional? What actually does something and what is noise? Where's the signal and where's the noise? That is the way that I choose to look at it. There is, due to fashion and the perpetuation of industry, fashion industry, and let's mention the selling of lifestyle, you know, through all sorts of things like electronics. Like Apple has this amazing brainwashed group of people that are obsessed with the culture of Apple. I've had a friend that bought like four iPods in a row just because they kept coming out with new ones. And he just decided to keep, keep going. It's like the cult of Apple. It's amazing. I'm not putting Apple down per se. They have a lot of creative stuff happening. But it's, it's, what's, it's the social aspect that they generate, which works to their advantage by making it a fashion aspect, making it fashionable. I find that to be um, I find that to be very destructive. So back to your point, it's a it's a gray area, and I think you know if a girl wearing earrings. What if an alien came down and said, "Hey, and by the way, I'm not opposed to earrings. I mean, it's fashionable, but what is the point? It's fashionable in within a particular culture, but what is the point? That's all we're, we're really asking. I don't care about the ornamentation aspects. I just wish people would think about why they're doing it, and not to get too caught up in the system at large. All, everything rampant today is utter materialism, and there is a great deal of deceit. Uh, there is, of course, a difference between somebody putting on eyeliner and somebody getting an entire uh, cosmetic, cosmetic surgery on their face to change their appearance. In the end, I really don't care about either one of them. It's not really that important to me, but I think it's worth, from a value system angle, to, not, to, you know, to convey the fact that people don't need to be that insecure, I guess is my point. But if an alien came down and said, hey, I see you have earrings, what are those for? Uh, the, the girl, if she's wearing earrings, might say, well, they're ornament. And then the alien might say, well, what's ornament? And then the person might say, well, it's an expression. And then the alien might say, well, what is, an ex what is, an, is it an expression of? And then the person might say, well, it's an expression of individuality. And then the alien might say, well, why do you need to express your individuality? And there's the crutch of the issue. What is an individuality? Is it a cultural aspect? Is it a natural human issue? I, it, these are these are these are debates that can be left open to anyone, but I think anybody out there can see the extremity. I mean, it, there's there's shows on reality shows about making people up, and uh, anyway, I don't want to go into all that. There's just so much nonsense noise related to fashion and ornamentation that almost makes the utility of of what we use secondary to their fashion statements, and that is an absolute contrivance. That is an absolute contrivance. Art should be functional. I. I once said uh, the, the, in, uh, the Art of His Film Festival that art without conscience is meaningless, and I, I really believe that. The greatest art, which uh, could be considered a form of ornamentation, is art that has a communicative aspect to it. There's a reason why the Beatles are still so powerful, because their songs had merit. They had something empirical to them. There was, there's a reason why John Lennon's Imagine is one of the most prolifically denoted uh, well, excuse me, one of the most uh, recognized songs probably of all time because it has a statement to it. You know, art for the sake of art is cool, but, uh, you know, I'd, I'm much more impressed by art that serves a function, and that's what the Psychos Media Project is going to be about. I, I love art. I'm a, art is more powerful than intellect as far as I'm concerned because it is able to pull at the emotional strings of people in ways that general intellectual knowledge cannot do. You have to, that's why the Zeitgeist and Zeitgeist Addendum are what they are. They're, they're half art pieces. That's why I have all those gestural things in there. I'm trying to average out every angle I can find, both intellectually and aesthetically, to get under people's skin. And I think that's, that's really the nature of communication in general, if you think about it. There's always that combination. So anyway, going back to the deceitful aspect, you know, I think that can be, that can be averaged out enough. And you can figure that out for yourself about where is which. And again, it comes down to values. I'm not against, Jacques and I are not against just 
people being ornamental. But where, what's the function? You just have to ask yourself the questions. I think only the individual can figure that out. It's just vanity. Where does it become vanity? Number 17, God, I'm running out of time. Peter, your lack of appreciation for physics causes you to question the importance of particle accelerators and research in astrophysics, but I would think that a Venus Project Society would thrive off of this research. I assume they're referring to the, um, to the super collider that I mentioned in another radio show. Well, let me continue his, his uh, question. I understand that you want to see more efforts to solve immediate human problems, but you're blaming the wrong thing. If you're going to blame something for the lack of human concern, blame everything except physics. Well, I don't, I'm not sure how you got that, that conclusion. Uh, I'm not blaming physics, obviously, at all. I'm blaming people. I'm blaming the value systems of people that are detached enough from humanity to build things that while they might serve an important function in time, do not hold priority at this point in time. We can't even take care of ourselves yet. And we're going to build a $10 billion super collider, which, based on what I've read, has lots of possibilities. I don't even think the thing is even working yet. But has lots of possibilities regarding physics and understanding and astrophysics. That's great. But is astrophysics really number one priority? Is it social priority? That's what I'm talking about. Social priority. If we got all the scientists together that are putting all their effort into this and put them on a social project, such as feeding the one billion people, such as making energy abundant throughout the world, why can't we do that first? You'd think that would make more sense. You'd think that would solve a lot of the instability problems we have across this planet, from wars to terrorism to, to just blatant poverty to disease. Why aren't all these scientists working on HIV? Why is it that these... These uh, people that, um, you know, whatever, you, I think you see my point. Cancer, you know, if they want to, well, I'm not even going to go into that. I think I made my point. Number 18. Peter, you seem to know very little about, oh, this is the same individual. You seem to know very little about psychology and neuroscience when you say that computers are superior to human beings. All right, I'm going to stop you right there. I've never said that computers are superior to human, to human brains, excuse me, is what they said. Uh, they are superior in certain ways. That's all I've ever said. Let me continue the person's statement, though. While computers may be more proficient at making raw computations, calling them superior in general is a massive disrespect to the human nervous system. Uh, the human nervous system, I'm not disrespecting the human nervous system. I'm very aware of its complexity. You're misunderstanding my point, but let me continue. Did you know that there are more synapses in one human brain than there are stars in the known universe? I did not know that. Uh, but that doesn't mean anything. Continue. This is why computers cannot even approach the abilities of our brains, and even in areas involving cognition and creativity, the most advanced computer on the planet cannot compose a piece of music or paint a complex piece of art. That's actually wrong. Read uh, Age of Intelligent Machines by, by um, Ray Kurzweil, and he has computers in there that he's programmed that can both compose music and uh, paint art. In fact, uh, during Roosevelt administration, they had a they had an electronic automated system that used light to scan the person. In fact, Roosevelt was painted this way, if I remember correctly. And uh, it could scan him, and he could paint with an airbrush, almost an exact replica of Roosevelt. And an artist came up to the, to the guy who made the machine and said, well, you, yeah, yeah, but the machine can't be creative. And the guy flicked a switch that was called random, I believe. And the, the painting mechanism started to accent different attributes in a very uh, caricature type of way. Uh, that was very primitive. That was many, many years ago. Uh, the issue of computers being creative is not the point at all. I'm not talking about that, and I'm not disrespecting the nervous system. The human brain is obviously one of the most is the most complex thing that we've ever encountered, that we've ever attempted to realize. We're trying to realize ourselves, basically. Uh, that has nothing to do with with my disposition on computers. Our brains cannot angularly compute in a way that computers can with the consistency that they can, uh, unless you're an extreme savant. Even extreme savants, I've yet to see one that can have the flexibility of a computer program to do trillions of computations a second with nearly 100% accuracy, or you know, almost entirely 100% accuracy if you pull out any calculator. Uh, these are amazing, singularly focused technical constructs, and has nothing to do with you know being superior to the human brain holistically. It has to do with being superior to certain functions. And when it comes to delegation of thought processes, when it comes to formal logic, not talking about creativity here, uh, computers completely destroy the human brain at this point, and they're going to continue to do so. And I think, uh, I think in about 40 years, you're going to see some spooky, spooky things 
happening from artificial intelligence. But, you know, uh, I, you know I'm sorry that you interpreted me that way. I, it's, uh, there's no way a human with, its, with his emotional characteristics can do what a computer can in the application required by the Venus Project, and that is the taking in of all relevant variables for technological processes and regulating those variables for specific ends. Only a computer can take in all the variables of natural processes that exist on this planet into a massive database. Humans simply can't do that. That's all I'm talking about. Number 19, I remember you saying there is no such thing as intelligence and that it all just depends on the knowledge of a person. I agree with that, but how do you explain that some people can study it very easily while others have to read a book or hear an explanation several times before they understand it? Doesn't that make some people more intelligent than others? Good question. That depends on, depends on your definition of intelligence. In Fresco's definition, which I adhere to, intelligence is an ongoing process. Like He gives a classic example of an electrical engineer. Electrical engineer <clears throat> 50 years ago couldn't get a job today because his information is outdated now. So there's that level. There's two types of awarenesses of intelligence, I think, generally speaking. You have your raw computational ability. Uh, that would be, that would again, be the savants, these, these mathematical geniuses that, can, that have uh, specific algorithmic instructions somehow mentally locked in their brain. And, you know, they can go back, they can know the date that somebody uh, was born on and remember it. There's one individual, actually, who could remember, I think, 92% of everything he ever learned. But he was mentally, essentially mentally deficient, mentally retarded. He was structurally... He's, he was impaired. He, he needed help to do normal things. So it's a severity. What is that intelligence? Is a savant really intelligent? No, they're intelligent in certain ways. So there's two kinds of intelligence. There's awareness and there's raw computation ability. You have people with mathematical abilities. They're intelligent in a particular way. Then you have people that are, you know, that are generally aware of lots of things and they're intelligent about typical subject matter. They're, you know, sort of a trivial intelligence. A, a um, a broadness, a generalization of their understanding. So people, back to your actual question, the uh, intelligent aspects comes down to the wiring of the individual. There are genetic components to that, just as though there are cultural components to that. And uh, savant is the, the most extreme example of a wired form of intelligence. But, you know, is that person really intelligent overall? You just call them intelligent? No, they're intelligent in specific ways. So it's, a, it's an open-ended definition of the term intelligence. Some people do have to read books. Some people have more synaptical you know, receptors in their brains than others do in certain areas. Uh, from what I understand, savants have huge concentrations in certain areas. So there is a physiological slash genetic aspect to it, of course. But in the way that we define intelligence as far as your average individual, it has to do with extracting relevance from a situation and gaining, gaining feedback from the environment. Just because you can't read as fast as somebody else, I don't think is a measure of intelligence. Um, it's a complex question. I think it more has to do with the way you process information that's most viable to the external world. And again, another level of television could be happiness. You know, it's, if you're, I have some of the most depressed people I've ever met have sadly been the most intelligent, like the highest IQs, you know, intelligent in that particular way. By the way, IQs only measure a certain type of intelligence as well. And, but some of the most mentally, um, emotionally problematic people are the ones that seem to have advanced capabilities uh, physiologically in their brains. So it's, you know, that's another question. That's just food for thought. But uh, as a basic answer to your question, uh, intelligence is, uh, I consider intelligence the way Fresco does, and that's about a matter of information being taken in. Uh, there's, of course, going to be a threshold of people that have severe problems taking in certain information, and then, of course, those that have absolutely advanced aspects and computational abilities. But uh, are they, they're basically both measures of intelligence in different ways. And I wish I had a more clear-cut answer on that. But uh, I think that should suffice for something to think about. Number 20. I want to know if you could touch on the word zeitgeist. I had talks with people saying how they have had a problem with the word zeitgeist because of its German origin. And the first thing they think of is Nazis. Have you considered changing the name of the movement, or do you feel the word itself is not negative in any way? To say the word zeitgeist is related to Nazis is to say that if the movement had an Italian name, it would be related to the mafia. So, no, I, zeitgeist is, 
or origin of the word has nothing to do with Nazism, has nothing to do with Germany other than the fact that it's a German word. It means the cultural spirit of the time. I think uh, it's just a simple intellectual connotation. If someone has a narrow, narrow view of a, a word just because it's German, they think it's Nazi. I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't think of any way to uh, to assess that, and I certainly wouldn't want to compensate for somebody just because they have such a narrow view. Number 21. We've been having some trouble in academic environments with some people when they read or hear your statement that the movement does not recognize classes and that it is not a political movement. Please clarify, wouldn't it be better to define the movement for what it is instead of what it is not? Well, I think we've, we've gone to great length to define what the movement is as opposed to what it is not. I think my issue with classes, well, first of all, we... When we say we don't recognize classes, I mean, obviously, we see that they're there. It, it has no basis in the decision-making process. We see humans as equal. It's an egalitarian approach. Classes are not recognized and taken into consideration in this structure because they don't exist in this structure. So that's all that really means. I'm not, I hope that, that answers your question. Uh, I mean, it's not that I, I can see how people could misinterpret that, but that should be that, mis that type of misinterpretation is so off the wall um, that I'm not even going to address it. As far as the political movement, well, it, there's a, always been a classical difference between a political movement and a social movement. Uh, it, a social movement is uh, like Martin Luther King and the American Civil Rights Movement. That wasn't a political movement. It had political ramifications, but it, you know, these people weren't uh, running for office. This was an influential group, a social movement, and that's what the movement is. We don't appreciate the political side. We don't agree with politics in its very construct because it doesn't serve a function. Politicians are not educated in the ways required to operate society in the most efficient way. So, so therefore, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not a political movement. It's a social movement. It wants to, we want to change so many things, including the political establishment, the effect where it doesn't exist. So I hope that makes sense. Number 22, hi, Peter. In your interview on Erie Investigations, you were talking about competition and where it comes from. I was watching a documentary that was discussing sexual selection. It appears that sexual selection in a Darwinian sense is responsible for humans creating music, sports, etc. Again, what are your thoughts regarding sexual selection, and th is this something you would be covering in Zeitgeist 3? <coughs> no, I'm not going to be covering that in Zeitgeist 3. I don't see much of a merit in that the real issue with sexual selection, while there is a com competitive aspect to it, uh, it's more based on a form of maturity and social respect. The I don't quite understand. I'd have to see the documentary you're talking about where it relates uh, sexuality to music and sports. I don't ne necessarily see that either. Um, just to give general background, the competition aspect is comes from scarcity fundamentally. I'm not talking about sports per se, but you know there's always this. Um, there's a requirement, if there's scarcity, people are going to compete for this or that. And I guess in theory, if two men want to mate, they would compete for the woman, and that would materialize in various ways or vice versa. But culturally, that could be offset, so it doesn't always erupt in you know, some type of sex crime or, or men beating each other up because they want the same woman. That, that's extremely primitive, and it doesn't occur that much today. I mean, it does, but not as much as uh, it might have occurred long, 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 long time ago. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer your question other than uh, uh, da, 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 da. what are my thoughts on sexual selection? It's a cultural phenomenon, and people will be mature enough to uh, have a respect for each other in time, and they, they basically already do now. You don't hear that many atrocities happening considering the number of people in the population, at least in the Western world. Of course, of course there's cultural differences, though. Really, it's a cultural phenomenon. I don't think it has anything to do with competition in and of itself. That's a tricky question. I'll have to give that more thought. Number 23, what will become of holidays such as birthdays, Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day, Father's Day, etc.? How will they be viewed in the future? I think they'll be viewed in a traditional sense. They will be recognized for what they are, <clears throat> which are just arbitrary celebratory days so humanity can have fun doing something together and they'll lose all the superstitious bases. He's, number 24, I'm concerned with concern that with many of the things we will create, even with technology, we consider very helpful today, require component materials and manufacturing processes never before found in nature. It's synergistic interaction 
interactions with and overall net impact on the rest of the environment uncertain. Therefore, should we, with our design methodology instead, attempt to mimic biological cycles, cycles, systems, and processes to the highest degree possible? Because I see that I see that with many of the Venus Project's infrastructural and design proposals, they appear to require properties and specifications that could be considered outside such principles or that of which will be difficult to achieve as totally safe in terms of synergistic effects on the whole system. <coughs> okay, first of all, the... Uh, the whole idea of of Jacques' foundation was the human body. I don't know if he's ever stated that to on the radio show, but he basically he basically looked at the human body and he said, you know, this is this is a system that works together, and this is the way that humanity needs to construct itself. We're all interconnected. Obviously, the symbiosis isn't isn't a metaphysical concept. It's right there in plain view. You know, it's you don't see the plug connected to us, but we're all deeply connected to everything. That's just fundamental. So that connection basis denoted, I think the processes that are denoted are much more natural than uh, anything that's been happening thus far. I don't believe that, you know, we're looking for things that are outside of the natural environment. In fact, nanotechnology is a very extreme form. People say that that's, you know, it's too dangerous or they say it's it's unnatural to, to do particle construction uh, from the ground up in, in a growth type of manner. But what is nanotechnology? Nanotechnology is based off of the current machines that are in our bodies now. When you cut yourself, all these little machines are instantly directed by your nervous system to run and fix your wound and you heal. This is, uh, this is exactly what nanotechnology has learned. And if they can learn that process of nature, then our abilities would be unbelievable. And it is very much based on natural processes. Uh, see, the seed of a tree. Jacques talked about this. He, he talks about structures that have memory, where you, just as a seed has memory, where it can grow a tree from memory, incredible. If you think about the magnet, just unbelievable process interaction that comes with the seed interacting with the environment to be able to, to culminate these huge organisms, uh, that can also be harnessed. And Josh talked about that, as I said, when it comes to building const or constructing homes. You can have memory elements that are condensed, and when electricity is run through them, they literally just blow up into pre-structured elements. And uh, those, I think, are absolutely natural. They might they would seem exceedingly foreign to someone who doesn't know the basis of it. But uh, there's nothing in the Venus Projects or Jacques Fresco's work that I see as, as unnatural at all. In fact, I see it as an absolute return to natural processes, getting away from all of the monetary contrivances that we have, again, with companies like Monsanto that are biologically gen uh, engineering things to go against natural uh, abundance, which I think is one of the most dangerous things that our system does due to the greed-based monetary system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Number 25. How does the Venus Project create an environment where it is socially acceptable for people to change their position on some issue when they're being confronted with what is obviously compelling evidence? Right now in the monetary system, as you have rightly pointed out in Zeitgeist Addendum, there seems to be a lot of negative connotation with being proven wrong in our culture, so I was wondering if you had any specific thoughts on how this social defect could be mended in the resource-based economy. That's a terrific question. I think uh, once being right uh, no longer becomes a no longer becomes a socially um, sought after nuance. For example, Tim Galloway he wrote all these great books called The Inner Game, and uh, I have a quote by him actually in the end of Zeitgeist One, and I think in the beginning of Zeitgeist Addendum. He uh, he wrote all these books on the inner game. It's all about you know humans. Um, Having, well, actually, I'm not going to go into what his entire uh, disposition was, but he has a great, a great example in one of the lectures I have of his where he talks about going to the dentist, and the dentist was working on his mouth, and he says to the dentist after he was pausing for a moment, he says, so did you learn anything while you were working in my, in my mouth right then? And the dentist, according to Galloway, got very indignant. He said, what? What are you talking about? I'm, prof I'm a professional. I didn't learn anything. I know what I'm doing. As though Galloway was trying to challenge him that he didn't know what he was doing, and Galloway stated, he's like, yeah, because the guy was afraid to be afraid to be wrong. And uh, I'll probably change dentists, is what he said, because <laughs> the learning process should be the most respected. It shouldn't be you, everyone knowing. Uh, that's just been so reinforced on so many levels. I don't even know where to begin with that one. But uh, being open will be be the sought after disposition, not being closed. Um, how will this if, this occur? It'll become through reinforcement of people not being insulted 
when uh, they're proven wrong, not getting Fs on a paper and someone else getting an A. There's all, all the reinforcements like that are what, are what create this uh, psychological neuroses. Education um, will play the biggest role. You know, emergence is constant. It should, it should be a cultural norm to be proven wrong. Um, and again, sadly, our system rewards the opposite. Actually, another Galloway point I thought was good. But I'm not sure if it's 100% accurate, but I think it's worth considering. Is he stated that uh, what's the difference? He said, excuse me, children before the age of seven or eight are the, learn the fastest and the most quickly. They the quickest learning processes. And granted, in part, that could be due to the, the brain development. But in his mind, he said, what is the difference between that uh, six or seven year old versus an adult really? And his point was. They don't think that they know because as you get older, it becomes a bad thing not to know. But children don't have that disposition yet. They haven't absorbed that culture to be obsessed with being an authority or knowing. They haven't been brainwashed yet. They don't think they know, so they absorb everything, and they're curious about everything, and they're not locked down. And I think that's a, that's a very interesting point. They don't think they know. Number 26. Occasionally, when out with friends and family, I get into discussions, debates with him about the Venus Project and a resource-based economy, uh, usually a them versus me sort of thing. One question I haven't been able to answer is, and I'll try to use the exact quote, if everything is researched and made the best it can be, who will put research into creating the best butterfly catcher, for example, or other non-popular activities? P.S. I realize this is a bad example but that was the exact question they asked. Okay, uh, here's how you answer that question. In time, in time, the the way things are created, the way products come to be, will be on a personal level. In other words, if you need a chair, say you need a chair that um, has a specific height, specific depth, and maybe has a property that uh, is foreign than most chairs that you have. Something about the the angle of the back. Maybe you have a back problem or something. In time, and they already kind of have this now, but you will go to a site, a website most likely, and you will be given a program that will design the chair with you. And you will design exactly what you need. You have to have a certain degree of intellectual language, but one of the hopes is that people in, in this type of culture will gain scientific understanding. Everyone will have a foundation in some type of schematics and, and just so they can interact with the system. If they're not educated enough to interact with the system, how to create things within the system, then, then they're at a loss. So it's up to them to become educated. It's not up to them, but it's up to them to become a part of it. And hopefully the educational system at its infancy will in, engage that type of interest. Okay, be that as it may, so you engage this program, you construct something from the ground up, it is then sent to a local factory where robotics are not designed for just one operation. You'll have mutable robotics operations designed for a large threshold of, uh, of construction. You'll have robotic construction that have just a large range of application. That you have, you know, if they're designed to work with wood, well, they can take your schematic and it can be put into a 3D type of environment as you create it. And then that, that measure by measure is sent to the machines and they can create custom aspects as you see fit. That's a very simplistic example. I know those things already exist in a very fundamental way. Customization is all over the place. But in time, I think you'll have very malleable machine operations which can create just about anything that you might want. And that's at the primitive stage as well because once nanotechnology comes to fruition, as based on what I've read and the promise that exists, again, I'm not going to go out and say that this is 100%, but uh, the science is there and the, what I've read is just truly phenomenal as far as the possibilities. I'm going to have a lot of information on this in Zeitgeist 3. Eventually, people will have generators for different things, and you'll be able to grow, so to speak, different elements out of particles themselves through construction. They will be constructed just like you construct bricks and mortar. Things will be created molecule by molecule, atom by atom, and that will be a whole new realm. Again, that sounds very sci-fi to a lot of people, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but I, I see no reason why you can't have customization throughout. And since there's no reason to sell, you don't have this need to create the aura of... Uh, of necessity of advertising and it's it's a system where people think about what they need and they interact with the system if it's not possible to do what they want then that goes into the system and they make it possible they become part of the system they become part of the interdisciplinary teams so there's many different directions I can go on that and of course it's not set in stone but this interaction with a systems approach to the creation of goods 
is going to be the future of things, and it's going to be the most conservative way to do anything. Instead of having things arbitrarily created through factories, sitting there in buildings, waiting for hopefully people to pick them up or sell them as they do today, or waiting for the advertising campaign to come out and shift the cultural values, instead, people will get things in real time, and they'll probably be created in real time instead of wasting resources by things sitting there. So I hope that, I hope that helps. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a good way to put it. I could go on a big tangent on that. And if you want to read the um, in, uh, Activist Orientation Guide, I believe there's a section that talks about that specific point. Number 27, I think I've noticed some dis- dissension between your thoughts and Josh concerning useless entertainment, such as fictional novels, movies, etc. I understand the importance of teaching useful things to our children, um, but he seems to, but I guess Jacques seems to be more extremist about the lack of usefulness of this type of entertainment than you are. Can you elaborate on your views about this topic, please? Sure. Well, it's a gray area, uh, like a lot of these points. Uh, you know, the question really is, what's the point? Does the influence of the media pose a socially positive or negative propensity? And that's, of course, a difficult, a difficult thing. I, it's very simple to see the, you know, the negative attributes. Again, vanity. Fashion and vanity. Uh, why is it that every year the same movies come out with the same storylines and the same plots over and over and over again? Because that's what sells. That's what the culture is used to. Why is there very little? There's very. I mean, people talk about regimentation in this new system. How everything's going to be regimented. We live in the most regimented society you could think of, especially when you get in the lower echelons of poverty, uh, the social stratification. Excuse me, of poverty. Uh, regimentation throughout. Pure regimentation. Your freedom becomes an illusion. Your freedom is actually associated with this concoction of vanity. So, uh, you know, fictional novels, uh, that, all of that stuff has, has, is fine. I don't really see why everybody keeps getting so bothered by this stuff. Entertainment will exist, but, you know, people's values will change. I'm not going to tell you what that stuff will be, but if you have a culture that doesn't reward greed and vanity and all of the things, and people just don't, they tend not to get so obsessed. They're not so conditioned by the marketing gimmicks that's put out there. That's really it. We're not conditioned by that. Most people that watch entertainment are conditioned into what they're watching. Anyone who ever turned on the reality show, Are You Hot?, that I believe was on ABC or Fox, anyone who even think of watching that has got to have a serious, serious form of neuroses, unless you're watching it out of, a, you know, a, of, out of a rubbernecking kind of thing where I will turn to things like that just to be blown away by how sick the culture really is, at least some parts, parts of the culture really are because of how the impression of consumerism and marketing. So these are false values, and that's really what it comes down to. It's not, I mean, entertainment, novels, all of that stuff has a, has a tremen- tremendous functional utility in open up, opening up people's minds, but to a certain threshold. So, again, it's a gray area, but I think you can see, I think I made a point before in a prior question, you can see the negative attribute quite easily if you just take a step back and look at the crap that's on television today and look at what it reinforces, look at the values it reinforces, and ask yourself, do those values have a socially positive relevance? Number 28, can we quantify the carrying capacity, amount of resources of the earth? What techniques will be utilized to achieve this? That's a great uh, question. Jacques was talking about different forms of optics scanning you can use uh, from the air to scan uh, heat concentrations and other forms of mineral deposits. Uh, that's, of course, a little bit limited. Obviously, there would have to be a great deal of labor involved in assessing these things, and, of course, machines would be part of that as well. It would be, uh, you know, it, you could do it from satellite. You could do it hands-on. Um, you know, it could be done one way or another. I'm not quite sure. I haven't really thought about the actual method to do it as far as the bare-bones methodology, but uh, basically you would just scour this planet. You do it. I think you would try optically first, and then you would use the optic sensors to, uh, to go and find the most specific points uh, that need to, be, need to be brought up and need to have operations based upon so extraction can begin. Um, as far as quantifying the carrying capacity of the amount of resources, uh, the two big issues that I think have already been quantified is food and energy, and those are the staples of survival as we know it today. Those are indisputably in high abundance, and they can be in abundance. It's simply a matter of technological innovation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Minerals, on the other hand, are something that we – I mean, the whole planet has covered minerals. We haven't had a full assessment of that. There have been pockets of assessments. I know there was 
uh, something recent that was happening that uh, people were assessing things, I believe, in North America. But um, that's, uh, that's one of the issues. But the real beauty of the system, going back to the processing point, is that we don't have all the redundant waste. We don't have all the duplicity or the duplication that we see in our system today. We don't have all the competition. It's centralized in the sense that the highest optimized peak efficient products are created with the most conservative usage of materials and resources as computed by a computer through formal logic. And once that happens, you know, and things are made to last, I, I see, and again, I'm going to go into this in Zeitgeist 3.2. There's more information to this I don't have in front of me. I will uh, distinctly point out that the carrying capacity of the Earth far exceeds anything that the public has been told. Certainly has nothing to do with overpopulation, which is the buzzword these days which is terrifying. The establishment really, for some reason, wants you to think that's the case because it gives them, you know, a way to, to renege on, on caring about the people that are starving and dying in the third world. Number 29. Hi, Peter. I've been listening to some broadcasts and have heard questions regarding the wearing of jewelry, entertainment, sports, hunting, drugs, basically things that have to do with our personal freedom in the world today. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. I think this has to do with essentially what I just asked, with what I just answered two questions ago. Um, okay, this person is concerned that the mental picture of the Venus Project is somehow negative to people because it seems like we are against things that he or she is writing, uh, excuse me, that they associate with freedom assuming that wearing jewelry or watching TV or playing sports or hunting or doing drugs has something to do with freedom. Well, yeah, in a very fundamental sense, and there's no, again, there's no laws to restrict these types of things, but it's a value, cultural value shift that we're going for. So to talk about, I, I, I haven't, you know, if, if I meet somebody that's so full of vanity, they can't see through the shallowness that's perpetuated, the vanity that's pushed forward on this culture, I don't know what to do at that stage. I hope that you can assess what I, what I denoted in the prior questions and uh, understand my angle on this. It's the same question. Uh, there, no one should look – the mental picture of the Venus Project should be in the form of purity and should be the form, uh, in the form of functional utility. What is functionally relevant? We have to take care of that first. We haven't even gotten that right. So why should we, would be, why should we, we be worrying about earrings and uh, sports and things like that? I hope you see my point. I'm not saying that people can't have forms of entertainment and enjoyment at this stage, but you know, if your values are, are caught up only in jewelry and entertainment and sports and hunting or drugs, uh, then I, I hate to say it, but there's an aberrant conditioning there to be that detached from humanity, to be that detached from what the real world actually consists of, to what actually puts food on the table, to what actually does things that are socially or personally relevant. So I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go off on that tangent again. I think I drilled that into the ground in the prior question. Number 30, I realize that the education system is a business, but don't you think it would benefit the movement to have traditionally educated people speaking and writing about the movement publicly? Jacques has mentioned his lack of credentials have prevented certain professional options to, for his ideas, and someone who has traditional degrees may help sway public audiences with articles, books, and lectures on the movement's ideas. Uh, would you agree that someone who has graduate degree in sociology would be more credible, not in general, but to the public when writing and speaking about the ideas of the movement, than someone who doesn't? It's sad, but I think that most people need to see credentials to pay attention to something. Well, I completely agree with you, and that's why I'm trying to get as many credentialed people as I can in the new film. It's not that I want them to – it really has nothing to do with the pushing of the project per se, but the aspects of the project that we talk about. Uh, unfortunately, it's very risky for most academics out there that hold that hold tenure ships or that hold positions in uh, high education for them to come forward with advocation of what is would seem to be for many ex an extremely extremely radical quantum jump for society and I think we will eventually find something like that i haven't gone out of my way to do it because because it's not um I will for the film as I denoted but i it's the kind of thing that even, even though I engage people like this, I don't want it to be based on uh, based on academia. There's a problem with academia because of its restrictions. But anyway, I don't want to go into all that tangent because I'm running out of time. I completely agree with you, and there will be people like that coming forward, uh, at least in a detached manner to, to denote the aspects that are relevant. 
such as experts in robotics, such as experts in artificial intelligence, such as experts in psychology, such as experts in sociology, that can talk about all of the aspects that we talk about, and but maybe they were not willing to go the length to talk about uh, the end conclusion. I'm really not as concerned as pr getting people that are just in full support as I am getting the so-called academics to to come to terms with the issues that make up the Venus Project, that comprise the values and systems approach that we're talking about. So I hope that makes sense. Number 31. Peter, what is your opinion about suicide? Do you think everybody should have the right to choose how much they want to live and that the system provides methods for peaceful death for, one, for the ones who require it? That's a very difficult subject. I think you know the emotional distraught aspect of people that tend to commit suicide, I think they should be engaged and uh, they shouldn't. It, usually a suicide it becomes a cry for help. So on that level, I think there's, it shouldn't just be allowed to happen on that level because there's problems with them and they need to deal with the problems and they've reached the point of extremity and a point of capitulation where they just can't handle it anymore and they, they very well could be could be saved, you know, if they were engaged and were talked to and were, you know, the problems were sorted out. Um, now, on the other extreme, if we're talking about um, planned, like a ter terminal illness, death, people that are dying and they know they're going to die and they're suffering extensively, Obviously, anyone in that position should have the right to do whatever they want to do. Uh, that's very different from the extreme emotional problem. This is a physiological uh, death around the corner type thing. If they don't want to suffer anymore, I see no reason why the law or any nonsensical religious notion should stand in the way of one person's decision when they're suffering and they know they're going to die anyway. So again, that's a very complex subject. I'm not going to say anything more than that. That's certainly my perspective on it. Number 32, Peter, you said that on one of your you said on one of your previous radio shows that you believe that most people you think are full of it are lawyers and philosophers. I doubt it since you and Jacques Fresco I doubt, excuse me, since since you and Jacques Fresco seems to hold general semantics in such a high regard that I need to point out that philosopher one is not philosopher two. Is there really no philosopher dead or alive that you agree with? Uh the issue isn't isn't a particular philosopher. It's the practice of philosophy uh, as it exists. I'm, I like philosophy in, in, in general, in general. And it's like I said, Denim, I talk about how religion needs to move into the field of philosophy because there are there are notions in religion, the reciprocation specifically, uh, egalitarian Christianity, that do speak to the human condition that will work to benefit, if people recognize the values, will work to benefit humanity as a whole. But um, that that that's a... The philosophy has to have an, a natural basis. Is what is the function of philosophy and practice, and how does it relate to the natural world? Is really the issue. Uh, I think George Carlin had one of my favorite quotes when it comes to the, you know, the the nature of philosophical thought as as practiced by so many people. Um, I think his quote is in one of his books. I believe it was, um, "Some people see what is and ask why. Some people see what is not and ask why not." Some people have to go to work and don't have time for all of that shit. And I think that basically summarizes my general disposition on most of the philosophy I have read. I am not interested in philosophy. I'm interested in natural feedback from the, from the outside world. I want to see things that, are, that are, have a functionality. I don't want to see mental masturbation. I don't want someone to tell me they, they've conjured up some ideology about the, the way humanity should function unless they have a premise to base it on that is mirrored in the external world, mirrored by natural processes. So that's really what we mean. As far as the semantic issue of lawyers and philosophers, yeah, it's all based in language. Um, you know, lawyers, are they twist words. It's a, it's, a, it's a semantic manipulation. I'm not saying that law doesn't have a practice of formal logic. It does, but only to a certain degree. Really, it's the, it's the backwards criminal aspect of what they're really engaged in. I mean, when two lawyers stand up, regardless of the assessment of the individuals, they're going to defend their individual person, their, the defendant or the, um, or the other person, they're <coughs> going to defend their clients uh, in the most, in the most uh, arbitrary way possible to help those clients. And if you really step back far enough and think about that, you know, such as, I don't know, the O.J. Simpson trial or other abomination trials that, you know, it's the wrong way to go about it. It's the absolute wrong way to go about our judgment of people, the justice system. So anyway, I'm deviating lawyers, philosophers, blanket terminology. Economists are up there with them as well. 
if you ever read the book Modern Money Mechanics, uh, just prepare to look at the nonsensical jargon that they throw out there and the way they use language to kind of blanket everything, to blanket the fundamentals. I could rewrite that book in one page, but you know they don't want it to read like that. They want to read in a way that seems complex, that seems authoritative, and the most authoritative disposition you can have is to sound super, super intellectual, super sophisticated, use lots of big words, and you can pretty much see through people immediately by the way that they speak and the way that they write. If every word is 11 characters long and <laughs> uh, anyway, they don't want to be understood. In other words, it's more deep to them not to be, but that's a tangent. Number 33, I'm running out of time here. Are you familiar with free software like GNU, Linux operating systems, and have you ever conceived, considered that the movement can officially support it and encourage people to fight for their digital freedom instead of the greedy corporate corporations like uh, uh, Microsoft or Apple? Uh, yeah, you know what, I, I have to use standard stuff because that's how file, file transfer stuff works. All my editing music stuff is, I've, I've learned the programs. And I, you know, Linux, sadly, because they're on the outskirts, don't have the, um, the versatility. Uh, but I completely and uh, utterly, utterly am, am in support. And I actually was intending to get a Linux system up a little while back. I still intend to do so. But any kind of open source, anything, is, is really a, a brilliant way to go. So I agree, and I, I certainly advocate it, but I understand the restrictions people have, especially when they become somewhat established with using certain programs that are proprietary, which goes back to the monetary system. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Number 34, during one radio address, Fresco said that we damage kids by having them be a part of such things as the Mickey Mouse Club. Hearing that and feeling myself that certain types of fiction are on the whole more destructive than constructive has made me wonder what your thoughts are about entertainment in general and more specifically works of fiction across all media. Okay, I think I've kind of answered this a little bit. Fiction, I think, has a, has a creative spot. It's People learn things about themselves from fiction. It's not just arbitrary. I mean, Art for the sake of uh, art is one thing. Art for the sake of communication is another. I think, you know, there's some great scientific prose I've, I've read that really opened up my creative thought. Science fiction, for example, is fiction, but very often it's extrapolated knowledge that, um, that really can open people's minds about what possibilities are. Granted, I mean, creativity, that's really what it comes down to, is, is creating new, new avenues of thought. That's, that's, uh, that's our novelness, so that's why exposing yourself to lots of different things and different environments, getting all that different stuff in your brain is so, is so positive because you begin to see things differently. You keep changing. So, you know, works of fiction are great. Uh, let me finish. Let me... What do you imagine? You know, he asked what I imagine for fiction, or she asked, in the, in the uh, Venus Project Society. You know what? I really can't answer that question. I think, again, there will be more of a, more of a functional quality to things that are created. Um, you know, I, I think fantasy will have a place to a certain degree. And I think some things will, will naturally become more despotic. You know, there's certain taboos that, are, well, there aren't that many anymore, but uh, there were quite a few in the past but for the wrong reasons. I think that um, social, social variance in, in media will continue, but the way people think about it will, will change drastically. Um, for example, there's chains of causality that you can see the interlinkages in. I saw an interview with Quentin Tarantino talking about his films and the violence in them, and I could easily relate to his uh, cartoonish way that he depicts violence, but there's always going to be somebody that has has a distortion there. There's always going to be someone that sees the glamorization of violence and takes it the wrong way. Now, I'm not saying that you outlaw anything. Of course, that's not what I'm saying whatsoever. Violence in the culture seems to be really supported, and I can't, I can't say that uh, it doesn't have an effect on the way people think. I, there's, there's a romanticism towards violence in this culture, which I think will eventually be grown out. And it carries over. You know, kids when they're like 14 years old will get shooting games on their entertainment systems, and then they'll go to join the Army. In fact, I think in Michael Moore's documentary, Fahrenheit 9-11, coming back to Moore, he actually has kids that are essentially talking about this. I mean, they're in simulators initially, some of them, and it's just like their, their video game environment. So it, it becomes detached. Um, I wish I could describe this a little bit better. It's unfortunate I'm running out of time. That's something for a longer train of thought. But I think, um, I think the violence in media will begin to subside. It will not be as socially acceptable. I think um, not to say that it automatically breeds violence in the external, but to some degree I think it does. And I think, it, I think anyone can see that. 
I used to I used to think the opposite and think that these things had no effect. It was all a matter of the intelligence of the individual. Well, in fact, it is a matter of the quote intelligence of the individual, or the judgment of the individual. But if if you're constantly bombarding somebody with specific gestures, they're going to be influenced by it, uh, regardless of how aware they are. It's just that's just the nature of impressionism, and uh, you can see that with cults. You can see that with just modern television. So that effect needs to be understood, and there needs to be more of a social conscience when it comes to what people choose to to feed into other people, I think. And again, that's a complex point. I really can't answer your question, and to negate rambling on about it over the next four minutes, I'm going to go to the next question. Number 35, do you have any affiliation with the Zeitgeist Movement merchandise being sold on Zazzle? No, I have no idea what Zazzle even is. And I unfortunately have grown extremely weary of shutting down people that have been trying to sell things. And I'll, I'll punch it up and check it out. I don't. I, I just keep looking the other way and stuff like that. It's such an annoying nuisance. Number 36. It would be really nice if you could use some of other people's work in Zeitgeist 3 movie, such as affiliate with the Media Project. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm actually going to be in contact with the UK Project. They've been doing some great renderings for for um, for Jacques and Roxanne regarding uh, the city constructions, and I'm going to see if I can get some stuff in there. 3D guys and any kind of media that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very personal when it comes to, I mean, I've taken a lot of information. We're very personal with the creative process and the way I, I kind of construct things. But getting media to help, especially when it comes to 3D, you know, of course, that's that's applicable. Um, I was lucky to get someone to contribute, a few people to contribute uh, for the last movie in that way. Um, as you know, that can be very expensive. Number 37, what are your views on the notion of moral relativism? How can you, for example, claim the moral high ground over anything else when morality is just culture? Well, let's see. I don't acknowledge the term moral, really. I mean, yes, it, it is culturally relative, and hence it's unempirical. Um, also, I don't claim a moral high ground, if that's what you're implying. I simply try to observe social and scientific patterns and figure out what is working and what is, you know, what is inevitable, what the trends show. Uh, I don't, you know... There's nothing that I've stated as far as values when I talk about vanity in television that I think can't be fairly objectively traced to motivations that are not for the betterment of humanity as a whole. They're for the betterment of self-interest. Anybody that is advocating these... Anyway, I don't want to go back into all that because I'm running out of time. Number 38, I'd like to ask if you consider it a positive or negative if a company was designed... Excuse me. If a company was designed that made products that were expected to last for long periods of time, i.e., a lifetime, in our current system, I would. I know this would eventually put people out of work, but the company wouldn't be for profit, and it could also be used as an example to show how, when a company creates a quality over quantity, how the system suffers. Ah, if you could, if a company can be put together that can create something without the need to take an income and support itself in this system and create lasting products, by all means, that would be incredible. Um, the technological, of course, would be beneficial. I'm, I really, I don't care about people's jobs anymore, and that you can't at this stage. There's no reason for it. It's outdated. It's over. The system has to transition. The jobs are not coming back. The um, the people need to. We need to devise a system. We need to devise a system that uh, that relieves this issue with occupation and labor. And that's really one of the fundamental tenets. And this has been on, going on for years, by the way, for years. Anyway, back to your point, I'm running out of time. Uh, it would put people out of work, and, you know, it would – in the end, that's one, of the, that's one of the catalytic things. I want to see more automation. I, this is the type of suffering that needs to start occurring for people to, to wake up. I want to go into a restaurant and have the entire thing automated and – see people realize that this is the new path, even if there's people homeless on the street. I don't, this is unfortunately a transition point. I don't know how else to, uh, to do it. Obviously, you'd want to set up a system that could help all of those people that are, are, that are displaced by automation. They attempted to do this, and again, I'm going to talk about this in Zeitgeist Addendum, where they would divide the work week. They would say, okay, we have, we have 100,000 people working in this sector at eight hours a day. We're going to bring in another 100,000 people, and we're going to have everyone work four hours a day. If the country right now gave a damn, if Obama cared at all, they would go back to these original policies that were developed during the Great Depression because it is the only logical step that you can possibly have. So that's about it. And um, I'm about running out of time, so I'm going to – Say goodbye and uh, 
And I'm sorry for the truncated thing, but uh, I appreciate everybody listening, and I will talk to you all very soon. Thanks a lot.